Hello, and thank you for joining us today for Earth Echo STEM Explore Virtual Career Connection featuring Rachel Beam, Senior Project Engineer at Pennsylvania American Water in McMurray, Pennsylvania. My name is Casey. I'm a Programs Manager here at Earth Echo International, and we're so excited to have students from all over the globe joining us as we learn about exciting and sustainable careers in science, technology, engineering, and math. This live event is part of STEM Explore, Earth Echo's program that brings inspiration to life by telling the stories of dynamic female professionals in STEM careers during live virtual career connections. We'd like to thank our founding sponsor, United Technologies, for their support of women in STEM and for their support of this program. Here at Earth Echo International, we believe that youth have the power to change the planet. Visit earthecho.org to learn more about our programs. You can also access resources like STEM Explorers career pro profile videos, as well as tune in for upcoming live events just like this one. Now, I want to recognize and thank STEM Explorers partner sites across the country, and I especially want to give a shout out to those joining us live today. So let's head over to Santa Clarita, California, to our friends at the Boys and Girls Club of Santa Clarita Valley at the Newhall Clubhouse. Hello, Boys and Girls Club. Wonderful to see everyone tonight. We're so excited that you could join in us. And now we also do have live, live sites that are joining us in Pennsylvania as well as Hawaii. So we want to welcome everybody tuning in this evening. And just a reminder, no matter where you're tuning in, you can send us questions for our STEM expert via chat. And we will break throughout today's presentation to see if you have any questions. So feel free to start typing those questions in the chat space and on YouTube or in the Zoom feed. We'll be sure to answer those questions as we go along. So enough with the housekeeping, let's go ahead and get started. I want to give a warm welcome to our special guest for Earth Echo STEM Explore Virtual Career Connection, Rachel Beam. Hello, Rachel. Hi, Casey and everyone. So wonderful to have you with us tonight. Now, Rachel Beam is a senior engineering, a senior project engineer for Pennsylvania American Water, a subsidiary of American Water in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania area. She has many years of experience designing and managing water and wastewater projects, including drinking water, domestic wastewater, and industrial wastewater. She is actively involved with the Pennsylvania section of the American Water Works Association and is passionate about fundraising for water for people to help bring safe and sustainable drinking water and sanitation solutions to people around the world. She graduated from Cornell University in Ithaca, New York with a bachelor's in civil and environmental engineering. And she does have a master's degree of engineering in engineering management. So Rachel, why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself and what it is that you do? Sure, thanks so much for having me. I'm really happy to be here. And a little bit about, um, quickly about my company. Again, I work for American Water, which is actually the largest and most geographically diverse publicly traded water and wastewater service provider in the country. So that map showing you all the blue and all the dark gray, we are in actually every state that is shown on that map. Um, 45 states plus Ontario. Um, we have seven over 7,000 employees and we treat and deliver more than a billion gallons of water every day. So we're a pretty big company. Um, again, I'm in Pennsylvania and uh, right now I am in McMurray, Pennsylvania. That happens to be both where I live and where I work. And I only have a four mile commute, which I love. I'm very close to my office. And um, just a little bit south of, of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, in southwestern Pennsylvania. So my responsibilities include, and my group, I have, there's other engineers who do what I do. We are in charge of managing capital projects, which means new or replacement facilities that are the backbone of our system, like how we get water to our customers and how we take the wastewater away. So this could be things like uh, water treatment plants or portions of water treatment plants um, that deliver drinking, that treat drinking water. Um, these are wastewater or sewage treatment plants, which treat the water that comes away from your homes and businesses. Um, this could be um, water storage tanks that um, hold drinking water. And these are often the most 
visible part of um, a drinking water system. They're very easy to see. Um, they provide, those tanks provide extra storage in case there's an emergency so that if something happens to your water system, there's gonna be some backup water. Um, they also provide water for firefighting as well and they provide steady pressure in the system. Um, we also do a lot of pump stations, um, especially in this area where it's very hilly. Um, we have water going up and down all the time and we lose pressure. So we have to have a pump station to boost that pressure. Um, in the sewage or wastewater side, we'll call them lift stations, but it's, it's the same idea. We're just lifting that water, lifting that, that sewage or wastewater so we can get it where we need it to be. Um, we have a lot of underground pipelines. Um, underground is a very busy place. If you go out onto the road, you don't see it, but there is a lot going on under the ground. Um, we have water and sewer pipelines that always need to be replaced so that um, we can try to avoid breaks and problems with them. So we're constantly replacing our underground pipelines. And then recently we've started installing um, some remote disinfection stations Basically, when your water gets to you, it has, it has a little bit of disinfectant in it that's required to, to help keep um, uh, remove bacteria. And those regulations in different states like Pennsylvania are getting more, more strict. So we are starting to put some disinfection further out into our system, away from our water treatment plants where they're further down the road to help boost that, that, that residual, that disinfectant residual. So um, I'm involved with planning and design and the construction stages. So planning might mean, you know, we're talking about what do we need and where do we need to put it? Um, the actual design is where we get into the details and then we create um, what we call design drawings and specifications that a contractor will actually use to then go and build the project. And then I'm involved in the construction phase. So when the construction actually starts, I'll go out on site and answer questions and make sure that the contractor is doing what they're supposed to be doing. And the whole point of this, of, of my job, is to make sure that um, these projects are delivered on time and within budget and according to the directions that we are giving our contractors to make sure that in the end result is so that our customers can get clean water and have um, clean water being discharged to our rivers and surface waters. So Rachel, you've shared a couple of, um, I guess a map and a schematic. So can you walk us through a little bit, like we're looking right now at the GIS map mm -hmm. of sewer manholes and pipelines. So can you kind of expand upon how you would use this in your work? Yeah, absolutely. So I put this in to give a little shout out to our GIS team. We have we have people across the company who do a lot of different types of jobs, and um, one of the one of our groups is a, is our GIS group. That's Geographic Information System, as you probably may know. And um, I just wanted to show this because we we use this regularly. All our map all our mapping um, is digital, and so. All those colored dots that you're looking at are um, manholes, basically. So you've seen manholes there. That's how we access our, our sewer lines. Um, you see them in the road all the time, right? Um, you probably don't pay much attention to them, but they're really important to us because that's how we access our sewer pipelines if we ever need to clean them, um, which we do. And so we are using this GIS map right now to better understand where our manholes are. Some of them get paved over because when the local municipalities do paving, they, they kind of disappear. So these are all things that people don't really think about, but they, they are very important. Um, this is very, very detailed work. Um, but again, so the GIS map is just showing different things that are going on in our system so that we know what's going on with this manhole. We found it, actually it's showing on our map, but it shouldn't be showing on our map. So we are updating our digital maps right now. Um, this happens to be in the city of McKeesport. Wow, so that's a lot to keep track of. <laughs> <laughs> and so. then let's see, and then you also have this design of new sewer pipelines. Can you tell us a little bit more about this? Yeah, so this is an actual um, construction drawing in progress. It's preliminary. 
Um, but this is one um, example of the type of drawing that would be um, part of a package that we would give to a contractor. And this is what they actually use to, to build our projects. So this happens to show um, that we're gonna put in some new, I was talking earlier about those underground pipelines. So the top of the drawing is showing kind of a what we call a plan view if you were looking from above. And then on the bottom is what we call a profile view. If you were looking at that pipeline, if you were kind of underground and looking at it and you can see um, what it would look like kind of from the side. So, it, so it's very detailed. Um, the work that engineers do is, is very detailed. It's down to the you know many decimal points. So we wanna know exactly what the slope of that pipe should be, exactly where it should be located with the very precise latitude and longitude. Um, so all of that detail gets shown on these drawings. So this is just an example, and this is an actual drawing that we are in the middle of, and we will be using it for, to construct this project um, hopefully next year. That's incredible. I, you know, the work that I do, I don't have to go into this level of detail. How many team members does it take? To, is this just one person who comes up with this schematic or are there more team members that are involved? Yeah, so um, we will often use, so engineers can do a lot of different things, but um, sometimes we will hire um, what we call a consulting firm and they specialize in, you know, designing things like this. So from their company, you know, for a project this particular size, they might have, you know, two or three people. They'll have someone doing the work in AutoCAD where AutoCAD is the software that creates these types of drawings. And then they'll have um, a manager, an engineering manager who's overseeing all of it. And then they'll have someone working on the permitting. Um, there's a lot of permits that are required from our local agencies, regulatory agencies for this type of project. And then, and then on my end and at my company, um, I'll, I'll be managing the project, but I will get input from um, people all around my company. So the, so people who are actually gonna use these facilities once they're built, I work with them a lot that's our operations side, um, our water quality people. We have all different departments. And so I interact with all of them. Um, so it just depends kind of on the phase of the project. That's amazing though. It's a, it's a lot of different hands. And I think our water, a lot of people, you know, we, we appreciate clean drinking water, but also when thinking about our sewer pipelines, I, I think it's something that we use every day, but we don't think a whole lot about. Right, for sure. Right, right, absolutely. And, um, you know, and, and the wastewater, um, you know, on the wastewater side, it's so important that that gets treated properly because that then, that treated water then gets discharged into, um, into our rivers or our surface water. And then eventually it is used again um, and pulled out of the river for our drinking water. So yeah, it's not something that people think about, but it's it's super important for people's for everyone's health and and for our, the environment. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So this is um, another example of a project that I um, worked on recently and had the privilege of working on. Um, this is a, a brand new water tank. Um, you've probably seen tanks like this out and about. Um, and we don't often build new tanks. We do a lot of um, repainting our existing tanks and sometimes we'll replace a tank, but this is actually brand new. We did not have a tank in this area. Um, the, the customers were served um, just from, from pumping the water. Um, this tank will provide a, you know, more consistent pressure and it will also provide uh, emergency water and water for firefighting if there were, if there were um, a, big, a large fire. So um, I was involved with this project from beginning to end um, and got to see the, the, whole, the whole tank being constructed, the foundation and everything um, to the final painting. And then on the inside, you can see that that piping, those are piping and valves. That's actually, that picture is actually taken um, from inside the bottom of that tank, at, inside the blue and, and the bottom. You can walk right into that, the base of that tank. And that's where all the valves and piping come into that tank underground. And then they go up through the middle. That's incredible because that, again, something we see every day that I don't think a lot of people have an understanding of what it's used for and its inner workings, but actually what it looks like inside. 
Amazing. So, um, Rachel, somebody that would go want to go into this type of career path, um, say, let's just talk in general terms of, say, civil engineering. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, we can even get to, into talking about the different types of engineering, because I do feel like that's another misconception is a lot of people don't understand the differences between the types of engineering. Mm -hmm. Could you maybe elaborate a little bit more on kind of maybe the path somebody would take to get here or even some real realities, like what could you expect to make as far as a paycheck goes? Mm -hmm. Sure. So if you are interested in this type of path and um, um, in an engineering path, um, you're gonna wanna be someone who's interested in details. It's a, it's a very detail oriented um, pathway but there are, there's also a lot of communications involved. So it's kind of this, you're kind of bridging both sides. You're, you're dealing with people a lot and you're also dealing with a lot of details and numbers. Um, so you would wanna take as many science and math, especially math classes as you can um, and get involved in any kind of clubs or outside organizations or activities that involve um, you know, science, math, um, and then you would, um, you know, apply to an accredited engineering school in college. Um, engineering is a field where you don't really have to have a master's degree. Um, it's kind of nice that way. You can kind of pop right out of school with a bachelor's and hit the ground running. So um, if you don't want to take on that extra debt, if you know, you know, if that kind of is, is a factor in your thinking, um, engineering is a very... It's a nice way to get started and if you want to go back to school later, but it's not the kind of thing like, you know, a doctor or a lawyer where you actually absolutely have to have um, a graduate degree. And um, so, and then as far as salary, so I work, um, I'm a civil engineer, civil environmental engineer. Um, there are all different types um, of engineering. As Casey mentioned, there's, there's, um, so within civil, there's a lot, there's, there's water and wastewater and there's um, structural and there's transportation. So that's just within civil, but there are also, there's chemical engineering, there's petroleum engineering, um, there is electrical engineering, um, there's computer science, um, there's industrial engineering, industrial engineering and operations. Um, so those are, those are probably some of the main ones. Um, and it kind of just depends on, you know, what you're interested in, but, but all of them have the same kind of idea that you're, you're designing things and you are, um, aiming to, with the goal of building something. Perfect. Well, I think that lays a really good basis for what it is that you do. So now we're going to open it up to questions. So again, anybody tuning in on our live streams, you can chat in questions to us. And I do have a couple of questions from our live streams. So Boys and Girls Club, you're on deck. So get ready because we're going to come to you for some live questions. One question I do want to ask before we go to Boys and Girls Club in Santa Clarita is we have a question coming in from our chat. And the question is, do you get to travel much for your job? Mm. So for my particular job, I don't. Um, personally, I just happen to work in this local area. Um, but um, if, you, if travel is something you're interested in, there are, um, and that leads me into um, my, one of the things I wanted to mention, which is that engineers can actually do a lot of different things. Um, you, can be, you can be very specific and do design, and maybe you would be in one place all the time um, or most of the time. Or you can, you can go on to become a manager where you're more, as you get more experience, you're managing people. Um, but then there are engineers who work in consulting firms, especially the larger consulting firms, um, kind of nationwide. You could end up traveling a lot more. Um, there are also engineers who work in, for the government um, for EPA or, or other governmental agencies and, and they might have some traveling or, they, or if they support the military, there are engineers who work <clears throat> in our military and they support them and they would end up traveling. Um, I think if you wanted to travel, probably um, you know, with a larger company who is constantly operating in different places. So I, I pretty much stay here because I, you know, we know our Kind of our engineers work in it, we focus in a particular area of the state so that we know that system and, and we can be a little more effective um, 
but if that's something you're interested in, there are definitely opportunities for, for travel. Absolutely. Great. All right, we'll come back to some other questions that we do have in from our live interactive chat, but let's head over to Santa Clarita Valley in California to our friends at the Boys and Girls Club at the Newhall Clubhouse. What questions do you have for Rachel? Okay, so um, um, I was thinking, do you guys actually build the machines or do you just design them? So that's a great question. Um, so the job that I'm in, um, I don't, I don't actually. My company doesn't actually build them. So there are other, there are manufacturing companies out there and construction companies. And you, and as an engineer, you could work for them as well. However, um, the particular job that I have, we are, I am kind of overseeing all these different pieces and parts and making sure that it all comes together. But there are um, manufacturing specific manufacturing companies. Like for example, the tank, um, that tank was the, the detailed design of it, like down to like every single little nut and bolt and the thickness of that steel that you're looking at steel that's painted. Um, every railing, every little detail of that was actually designed by a, by a specific company and they specialize in water tanks and that is all they do. And so, you could, uh, and they have engineers working for them. So those engineers are using software to design um, that that tank. Um, previously, you know, in years past, calculations would be done, you know, by hand. But now they're using software. But you still need to understand the theory behind it. Um, but the point being, um, there are companies who specialize in very specific items, and and so the tank being one of them. And so they would be the ones who come out and actually are building the tank or building whatever, whatever it is. Excellent. All right, Boys and Girls Club, do we have another question? We don't have another question right now. You're good for now? Yeah. Okay, sounds good. We'll come back to you guys. So hopefully you'll think of another one. Um, I do have a question coming in from the chat. So one question I have is, do you have mentors that you look up to or have looked up to? Absolutely. Yes, I have had mentors. My, my first mentor and my biggest inspiration was my mom. Um, and she is the one who really... Um, inspired me from a young age. Um, and then, you know, I had a couple of professors in college. Um, I had some teachers in high school. Um, I had a particular professor in college who was actually um, inspired my interest in water and wastewater. He just, he just had a, a passion for it and he taught it in such a way that I was just inspired to, to get into that field and, and feel that water and wastewater is something that no one should have to take for granted. Um, and then when I started working, I definitely had some mentors. Um, when you come out of college, you feel like you should know some things, but you really don't. Like you really, like you learn all this theory and you learn all this stuff and you kind of learn how to think and solve problems. And you're like, okay, I just spent all this money and all this time and I worked really, really hard and I pulled all these all-nighters. And then you start working and you're like, really don't, you don't really know. You don't really know. You, you have to learn as you go. So um, I have definitely had some amazing mentors who made it okay and made it, you know, absolutely. We're going to teach you. We're going to help you. And, and you really learn, you learn on the job. So um, those have probably been my mentors. And then in my current company, um, we, we have um, our CEO is, is a woman she has numerous women on our, uh, there's numerous women on our board. And I'm really inspired by that. Um, as I get older and, and, you know, as time goes on, there's more and more, more and more women. Um, so it is, it's inspiring to see so many women um, in those, in those levels of our company. That's great. And I think you mentioned something that I think when a lot of people think of the word mentor, they just think of kind of one person, somebody who inspired you. But I feel like 
you know, as you go through this journey that is life, you just meet all these different people along the way that inspire you in some way, or, you know, that you learn from. And so always keep an eye open for mentors. Um, because, and like you said, when you leave college, you, you think you should know, and, and it's not quite what it seems. And that, that kind of brings me to the next question we have, um, coming in from our chat space. This is from Mia in Maryland. And she asks, what did you do? expect to do with your degree when you started college? And then she has a second part to her question. Okay. Um, so when I started, I just sort of had this vague notion of saving the world. Um, I didn't really know what that meant. I wanted to study environmental engineering. I thought that protecting the environment was super important, but I also had this sense of um, making the world a better place for the people. So it was a combination of you know, I wasn't really sure how I wanted to, what I wanted to do with that, but I just had this notion of the environment and people. Um, and then it kind of came together with that, with that professor that I had, I think it was my junior year of college and it just sort of clicked. And I just thought this is, this is just a really cool field. You know, I, I would like to be involved with, with water and wastewater. So, um, so I did start, I started out in civil and environmental and environmental engineering from the beginning. Okay. Um, a lot of people switch majors, you mm -hmm. know, that's totally okay too. Um, I had a lot of friends who switched within engineering and then some of them started in engineering and did something completely different. So you don't always have to know exactly what you want to do, but I, I did stick with that um, field. I just didn't know exactly what I wanted to do when I started. <laughs> Got it. And so that you, you somewhat answered this. So the second half of that question was, did you expect to be doing the work that you're currently doing? Um, I don't think so because, um, I think even at, even, at, even in college, I really didn't have a good sense of, you don't really have a good sense of how the world works. And, and I, I knew that I felt that engineering was going to be a good path for me because I, I had this pretty, I guess, decent understanding of what they did, but I didn't know the details. And so it would have been too hard for me, I think, to visualize a, like a specific job. Um, but I felt that engineers, you know, I'm kind of a risk averse kind of person. And I felt like an engineering career would be like a pretty safe bet. And that, that has been true. Um, I have, I have not had any issues with, um, you know, job security or anything. Um, so that's, that's a nice bonus as well. Um, but yeah, I just, I don't think I even knew how to conjure up something like what I would actually be doing. I and don't I, know. I didn't know. Yeah, right. <laughs> and I think it's okay to not know. I think right. so many people get anxiety about that or, you know, um, young students are, are really pressured with decide your major and, and you need to know where you're going. And I, it's okay to not know, or it's okay to stumble and get back up and it's okay to switch majors if that's mm -hmm. what you do as well. So I think mm -hmm. it's just, you learn something from, from every single avenue that you take. So that leads us kind of into the second half of, of your presentation is, can you tell us a little bit more about you? Where did you grow up and kind of how did you get your start in this career? Sure, yeah, thanks. So I grew up in um, not too far from here um, in a small uh, rural town um, in Southeastern Pennsylvania, also not too far from Pittsburgh called Rilton. Um, and, um, I was raised, um, I'm an only child, um, raised by a single mom, um, with some help, with a lot of help from her parents, my grandparents who, who lived within uh, walking distance. Um, as I mentioned, my mom was definitely my, my strongest influence, um, growing up. Um, she really encouraged studying, um, and, and getting good grades. That was, that was always the first, that always was supposed to be my first priority. Um, and she definitely made it clear early on that that it was expected that I was going to go to college, even though she had not gone to college herself. Um, that was very important. And so that was always kind of ingrained in me. Um, and then I was kind of in, inspired um, at, a, uh, at one point by uh, my grandfather was telling this story about a friend of his whose daughter had become an, an aerospace engineer. And at that time, it's just not you know, it wasn't something I heard a lot about, like a woman being an engineer in aerospace. And so that just really stuck with me. And I just like the idea of, of being an engineer. Um, and so in, um, in grade school, I, I was able to enter into um, what they called the gifted program. I don't know 
if they still call it that. But um, so that was very, that was a very fortunate thing. Um, I think that was based on test scores. And, um, and then in high school, I took, you know, as many, I took a lot of honors in AP classes. Um, I did some running, I did tra track and cross country. I was in math league and, and some other activities. Um, um, I did consider becoming an, aeros an aerospace engineer, um, but I decided on um, environmental engineering instead. Um, and I also considered becoming a pilot, um, but I did not do that. I did become a pilot after I graduated, uh, just a private pilot. But um, ultimately, as I mentioned, I'm, I, like st I like stability. So I ended up going uh, with the engineering instead of the pilot. Um, and then um, as Casey mentioned, I went to college. I have, a, I have a bachelor's. I went to college in Ithaca, New York. And um, during college, I, um, I participated in what's called an engineering co-op program. And this is where um, companies come to uh, come to the school and they conduct interviews. So you actually have like a, it was like truly like a real interview. You develop a resume. Um, I think these days kids are developing resumes a little earlier, but back then, you know, by the, you know, in college is when you really start developing a resume. So it was great experience all around. So you go through these interviews and then you actually go and work. You leave school for a semester, either two semesters or a semester plus a summer. And you go and work and it's an actual real job. You get paid real money. Um, you're totally living on your own. You're not taking any classes. You don't have homework. You're just, you're just working. You're just out in the real world, in the real world. So that was really helpful. Um, and something that was something that I enjoyed and something I would recommend if, if you do, you know, get to that, to that point. Um, and something else I did in college, um, you know, college was, college was hard and I was kind of thinking of a way that I could try to set myself apart. Um, so I actually volunteered. I just picked up the phone book, which um, you all may not know what that even is, but before the internet, um, we had these things called phone books, which sometimes they still deliver to your homes, but just phone numbers. And I just started calling local companies in Ithaca uh, that, that dealt with environmental work. And it was really kind of brazen. I don't know where I got the, the guts to do this, but I just started calling people randomly. And I said, I, do you have any, basically I said, do you have anything I can do? I would be happy to volunteer for free. And um, I got lucky and um, this gentleman said, I, I, could use, I could use some help. I, I need someone to do some literature research on these chemicals called dioxins that I'm interested in. So, um, and this is a long story, but the reason I'm telling it is because um, I, when I interviewed for my co-op position, the woman I interviewed with actually knew this person just completely coincidentally. And, um, and she did tell me that and she called him and asked for, um, you know, a reference and he was able to give a reference. So, so the moral of my story is um, volunteering is a, is a really great, great way to get your foot in the door when you have no experience. Um, so, so that I, works out. That works I out think well. also a, a good lesson that you just said is putting yourself out there. Don't be afraid to, to pick up the phone, even though that's scary, but don't be afraid to pick up the phone. Don't be afraid to drop an email to somebody that you might know, or you just have some interest in. And uh, that's, I love that. That's a great story. And yeah, I'm, I'm curious to know how many of our viewers know what a phone book is these days. <laughs> <laughs> So um, can you tell us a little bit more about some of the work that you did outside of the U.S. after college? Yeah, so after I graduated, um, I still kind of had this sense that I needed to do more to save the world. And um, so I ended up volunteering um, with a group called Engineers for a Sustainable World. And I um, so I just spent it was just for a summer. Um, the Peace Corps seemed a little bit too um, too much too much for me. I couldn't get my head around that. So it was just some. It was just a summer, um, but I lived in um, uh, a little town in rural, very rural Oaxaca, Mexico. Absolutely beautiful, up in the mountains, and worked with this group of women. And the women you see in these in this picture, um, there's a, a man down in the front. He was kind of the organizer. He was our contact. And then the rest of them are local women who live in the village. 
and they were all um, the goal of their group was to you know make a better community so we were working through them and there were four volunteers and um, I spent a summer there and the original goal was to help them bring irrigation water um, and we worked on that and we had some success with that but there was some downtime. Um, so on the right, the picture on the right is us, is us trying to get set up this little pump. That's actually a, a pump. It's a, a hydraulic pump. Um, they didn't need a lot of water, so it's a very small pump. Um, and then, but we had some downtime and we had some changes in that project. So we kept ourselves busy. Um, on the left, um, some, some of the families in the village, um, they would bathe in the river. They didn't have any place to really bathe that was, that was private. So we, we got some materials together and we built, we built a couple of these showers. Um, we also taught English to some of the kids. Um, we, so the, on the left are, are the, my little kids with their graduation diplomas. Um, and then we, um, in the center, we built a stove um, so so the folks would cook inside their homes and then all of that smoke was just you know terrible for for air quality so we built this new stove that would um, you know send that smoke outside away from the house um, and then of course we did a lot of getting ingrained in the culture that's me on the right trying to learn how to make tortillas which is a lot harder than than you would think um, so. Yeah, so it was really an amazing, amazing experience. It was really an amazing experience. Um, and you said you did that right after college, correct? It was actually not right after. It okay. Was, um, it was quite a few years after. It was, um, okay. yeah, it, was, it wasn't right away. Yeah. And I, I will agree. It's, it's interesting um, that you bring up this particular program, uh, Engineers for a Sustainable World, because I think <clears throat> there's a lot of interest in traveling, and, and of course, making the world a better place. And so people immediately think of Peace Corps. And we have had a number of mentors featured on STEM Explore this year that have taken that path. Mm -hmm. But Peace Corps is a really big commitment. Mm -hmm. So the fact that you just found um, something in your own world, in, in your professional world that existed, mm -hmm. I think that's tremendous. And to encourage people to kind of look outside their doors and see if there are opportunities like this. Thank you. Yeah. And then there's another group called Engineers Without Borders. Um, maybe people have heard of Doctors Without Borders and they do they do similar work as well. So yeah, it was nice to find something specific for engineers. That's great. Now that kind of rolls right into here at Earth Echo International, we believe that you can act now for a sustainable future. And we're trying to encourage people to do that. So can you maybe expand upon a little bit of what some of the work that you do, how that contributes to a sustainable future. Mm -hmm. So, so my, my day job um, is really focused on um, making sure that we are getting um, clean drinking water to our customers, that they can turn on their tap and not have to worry about it. There are so many people in this world who can't do that. And even in this country. Um, so that's our primary goal. So. So my particular job, my specific role of regularly um, helping to replace and add new facilities is so important to that. Um, maintenance is, is absolutely key. You, can't, you can build something, but if you don't maintain it and you don't replace it um, before it breaks, um, then it's not gonna work the way it should. And then the same thing on the, on the wastewater or the sewage side, um, you know, making sure that um, those facilities are also maintained so that, you know, the water that eventually is discharged back and flows back into the river is, is clean so that our rivers are clean, our surface water is clean so that we can protect our fish, so that we can have those, um, those surface waters for boating and swimming and things like that. So it's all, it's all geared around public health and the health of the environment, um, as well as, um, surface water and groundwater. Um, and then we also do a lot at our company to, um, to educate our customers um, and the public um, about source water protection, um, what you can do to protect you know, your rivers and the ground and groundwater, um, how to properly dispose of, um, of hazardous waste, 
um, how to properly dispose of fats and oils and grease. And, and we actually sponsor hazardous um, collection events and prescription drug um, take back programs. Um, and then um, outside of work, I also am a volunteer with a group called, um, an organization called Water for People. Um, one of the things that I learned um, by volunteering, uh, my volunteering in Mexico is how important it is to have, um, to have a plan um, and to plan from beginning to end. And so Water for People works in, I believe it's um, eight countries um, to bring um, uh, safe drinking water and sanitation. And um, one of the reasons that I um, choose to, to help them is because they are so good at, first of all, they do a really great assessment. Um, they go in and they, they look at what's needed, but then they, they involve the local people and they don't just come in and build something and then leave. Um, they make sure that the local people are engaged and they're involved with actually constructing their own facilities. And then most importantly, they make sure that there's a plan in place. As I mentioned, that maintenance is so important. They make sure there's a plan in place um, so that those facilities can be maintained and replaced um, as needed. So um, that's my little plug for Water for People. I do fundraising for them. Um, you can also travel with them. You can volunteer um, with them and actually travel to the different co um, countries. Um, but I just do fundraising because um, money is important and they can't do anything without money. So the picture in the middle is me at one of our fundraisers and the other pictures are from, from Water for People. So that's the, one of the things I do outside of work. That's great. That's awesome that you've kind of found that niche and some other place that you can give back to not only the community, but to the world. And like you said, you wanted to save the world. That was your vision. Um, and I do wanna mention, um, this might be a good time to mention that here at Earth Echo, we also have a program that focuses on water. Um, the Earth Echo Water Challenge is an international program that equips anyone to protect the water resources that we depend on every single day. Um, the Earth Echo Water Challenge program uh, also builds public awareness of involvement in protecting water resources around the world by engaging citizens to conduct basic monitoring of their local water bodies. Um, so you can visit earthecho.org to learn more about the water challenge program. Um, there you can actually even buy little Earth Echo branded uh, water quality testing kits. And this is really our citizen science program. And it's for people to go out into their local communities, look at their local waterways and protect what they do have right there in their own backyard. So that's just kind of a little shameless plug about um, one of the magnificent programs that we have here at Earth Echo International that ties into some of the work that you're doing. All right, so it is now time for questions again. So we are going to head to Santa Clarita Valley to Boys and Girls Club at the New Hall Clubhouse. What questions do you have for Rachel, Boys and Girls Club? Okay, so I was wondering about the, um, how you convert seawater into, um, into Saltwater and fresh water. Is there oh, you can yeah. pumps or do you use um, like some sort of filter? Yeah, so desalination um, is the name of that. De that's a nice big vocab word for you, <laughs> desalination. Um, so that is becoming um, more and more, um, a more and more feasible solution. You know, um, years ago it was way too expensive, but you know, as the need has progressed and the technology, the technology has gotten better. So that would be done typically. Um, I don't. I don't. We don't do any of that because just to ca just to caveat my answer, I am definitely not an expert in desalination. But I'll tell you the little bit that I know. Um, we are we are blessed with an abundance of fresh water here in Pennsylvania. But in places like Florida, for example, where Casey is, they do have some desalination plants, and they, they basically use a filter. So you 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 hit it right on the head. It's a it's a very I think typically they use um, what's called reverse osmosis. Um, so the, I think there's some there's some front end treatment that has to go on. Um, and don't again don't quote me on this, but I think it is a, t a certain type of filtration. Um, reverse osmosis is a very um, is a very advanced type of water treatment. Um, so. So that's, yeah, so that's how that would be done. Excellent. Do we have another question from Boys and Girls Club? Now you can ask. 
So, okay. Um, is it true? This might sound really, really silly, but is it true that you find <laughs> mutated animals in the sewage or anything like high <laughs> levels of radiation? <laughs> That's interesting. And that... I, I think of a movie way back in the day that is far too old for any of you to know about a mutated uh -huh. alligator that was in the sewers. Uh -huh. That is, that's not a silly question. There are no silly questions, no. but that's no. good. Have you ever seen something like that of giant sewer rats or? <laughs> no, not that I know of in our sewers. Um, uh, fortunately, we don't, we don't have um, generally like radiations normally not not that i know of is not an issue but we do we do find some pretty amazing and nasty things sometimes in our sewers um but i don't think we've ever sometimes you will find animals like unfortunately animals who maybe haven't made it but um not none mutated nothing that exciting <laughs> <laughs> all right boys and girls club do we have one last question before we go I do have one more from the chat. All right, Boys and Girls Club. Well, if you do have a question, just pop right back in. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and move forward with a question that we have from Lily in our chat. And Lily is actually one of our Youth Leadership Council members. She wants to know what excites you the most about your job? Um, I really, I, I probably, I feel like I've, maybe you said this already, but I get excited about the idea, again, of bringing kind of the combination of bringing clean water um, to our customers. I've, I've worked on some projects even at, at work, not just in the volunteer side, where um, even in Southwestern Pennsylvania, um, people did not have access to um, reliable clean drinking water. And I think that that should be absolutely just a, a right, you know, absolutely right. You should not have to worry that when you turn your tap on, um, you shouldn't have to worry about what's coming out of it. So that makes me excited. And then, and then the fact that we do have wastewater in our, we have both water and wastewater systems. Um, I let, I get excited about the fact that we are treating, treating our wastewater and, and educating the public about how to keep our, our rivers clean and our groundwater clean. So, um, but mostly I, I do get really excited about the fact that, and, and people can go in and also not just clean drinking water, but um, reliable sanitation, because that's a big issue around the world. And even, even some places in the United States, um, it's just, it's not a given in it and it should be. So I like that. Absolutely. Our Great. Club. All right. Boys and girls club. One last time. Do we have one more question? What the idea of working with water, what inspired her? Was that your question? Yeah, after like uh, um, fresh and salt. Oh, fresh water versus salt water. What made you want to work? I have a feeling I'm going to know your answer, but what made you want to work, say, with that that freshwater aspect versus saltwater? Is that the question? Yeah. Perfect. Okay, so yeah, that's a great question. So, well, it's kind of simple, actually. The reason I work with um, freshwater and not saltwater is just because of where I am. Um, like I said, we have we are so. We are very fortunate in, in where I live in Pennsylvania and, and surrounding areas. Um, it, that's not the case um, everywhere, like in, in, in Western parts of the United States, um, which is more arid, that's fresh water is, is really an issue. But we are really lucky here in Pennsylvania and our surrounding areas to have a lot of um, clean, abundant, um, what we call surface water. So surface water would be rivers and streams. So that's where we, that's where we get our drinking water. Um, so we don't have to worry about um, desalination. Now, if I moved down to Florida and I wanted to be an engineer, a water engineer in Florida, I would probably have to learn a lot more about desalination because it is, it is more common there to have desalination plants. Awesome. Yeah. Well, great <laughs> questions, everyone. <laughs> Those are great questions. And Rachel, do you have any kind of words of wisdom or any advice for all, any students out there tuning in, whether it's about 
following your footsteps in your career working in civil engineering um, or water? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say for, I mean, I think for any career, even if it's not engineering, um, and I know you've probably heard this all before, but, um, you know, ask questions. Um, don't be like, I, I liked, I loved all the questions um, and look for ways to get involved. You know, like I said, um, take, take, take the hard classes, take math and science classes. Um, don't worry about being a nerd. Um, there's always going to be people like you. And those are the people that you want to be friends with. And conversely, um, don't worry if your grades aren't perfect. Um, you don't have to be a straight A student. Um, and look for opportunities. Ask your Ask your family, go to the library, the li librarians, even in this digital age, librarians are still an amazing source of information. Um, try to join local clubs and, um, you know, volunteer, like get involved with um, anything that you can that, that you're interested in um, because you never know where, where it's going to lead you. That's great. Great words of wisdom and especially good plug for librarians because mm -hmm. I agree librarians are a wealth of knowledge and if you have a local library or your school has a library definitely um, ask them for advice because they, like I said, they are a wealth of knowledge. Well, thank you everyone so much. Your questions were awesome out there. Rachel. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. Thank so, you for having me. Absolutely. So everyone can stay um, in tune with what Rachel's doing at work. If you follow um, Pennsylvania American Water on their social media channels, which are listed here. Again, of course, I want to thank all of our STEM Explore after school partner sites for being part of this fantastic program, but especially a huge shout out to Boys and Girls Club of Santa Clarita Valley at Newhall campus. Thank you so much for tuning in this evening. We're excited to connect with you again and you guys had awesome questions. Now, Earth Echo has some exciting opportunities coming up this month. STEM Explore will continue to feature women in STEM careers with our live virtual career connections. We have several live events that are scheduled for the rest of November, as well as on into December. So be sure to visit our website, earthecho.org, to see our entire lineup, and you can register for those programs right there. You can be an interactive site asking questions of our mentor live. Now, of course, stay in connected with Earth Echo International on all of our social media channels, as well as that website, earthecho.org. Lastly, thank you again to our wonderful STEM Explore mentor, Rachel Beam, and thank you to United Technologies for their tremendous support of this programming. On behalf of Earth Echo International, thank you for joining us and keep exploring. Bye-bye, everyone. <laughs>